Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Matthew Goff. Dr. Goff is Professor of Religion at Florida State University. His research interests include the intersection between wisdom and apocalyptic traditions, Second Temple Judaism, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Dr. Goff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that you know a thing or two about, which is the Book of Giants. So could you give us a basic outline of the story found in the Book of Giants? The Dead Sea Scrolls include a very fragmentary Aramaic text, which we call the Book of Giants. It doesn't have that title itself. So because it's so fragmentary, we don't have the full narrative, but we know a thing or two about it. And it's basically a story about giants. And the extant narrative is basically about two brothers, one named Oya and the other Hayam, and they have dreams. One has a dream of a garden that is burned, except for one tree with three branches, probably an allusion to the flood with Noah and his three sons. And then the other one has a dream of God coming down in judgment in a scene that's very reminiscent of Daniel chapter 7, which same time and also in Aramaic. And the giants kind of furrow their brows and not really sure how to understand this. So it's really about the interpretation of dreams and why. And so there's some indication in the text that these giants had various forms of transgressions, but the narrative doesn't focus on that, at least the extant part, that they consumed a lot, that they ate too much in very transgressive ways. And when we get into the Book of the Watchers, we'll say more about that. Um, and that they killed people, and the, so murder But the extant part we have is really about them trying to understand divine revelation. So they appoint one of their own, a giant by the name of Mahaway, to travel to Enoch, who also is very important in Enochic literature, like an antediluvian sage par excellence. A lot of ancient texts are attributed to him. We can say more about him. But the presumption in this text is that Enoch knows everything. And also that he's kind of removed, he's on earth, but removed from human society. It actually says that Mahaway has wings, which is sort of gets at the issue of how we understand a giant versus how they did and like sort of what creatures we're talking about. But Mahaway flies to Enoch and asks questions about this stuff. And it's interesting. They choose Mahaway because he had traveled to Enoch in a previous instance. So the narrative we have is actually the second time something like this happens. So there's actually a whole other narrative that part of it that we don't have. And we don't have an Enoch's interpretation. It doesn't survive. But we know that Mahaway brings tablets back to him that were written by Enoch. And on these tablets are written judgments. So let's call it an antediluvian tale about giants and their struggle to try and understand Revelation. And basically, the whole idea of divine judgment against them is a way to understand the flood, like why the flood happened and the idea that it's because of these sort of transgression of these giant figures. That's it in a nutshell, the fragments of the Book of Giants. One thing that immediately springs to mind there is the motifs that you often find in apocalyptic literature, the motif of dreams, the motif of trying to interpret these revelations, the idea of bringing back Enoch's tablets, you know. Normally what you get in the apocalypse is is the revelation is given to some sort of important venerable figure like Daniel or Abraham or Enoch. But in this case, it's these giants and sort of why give these giants advanced knowledge is one of the sort of the big interpretive questions. So it's like the apocalyptic literature, but it also is kind of doing its own thing. I would stress. Just in that sense, imparting this revelatory knowledge to a transgressive figure also kind of reminds me of the Gospel of Judas. Why is Judas getting all this otherworldly knowledge about he's not the best figure either? So, you know, that's in that sense. There's a tradition you see in your viewers might have a, a sense of this. The stuff we're talking about with these giants has some sort of relation to a very obscure and interesting verses in the beginning of Genesis chapter six where it talks about the sons of God coming down and having sex with women. And it talks about them having children and the children, they can be translated giants. And one of the things you see there that troubled a a lot of commentators is this idea that you're as a response, the lifespan is given to 120 years, which is odd because lots of people in Genesis live 
beyond 120 years. One interpretation that you see in rabbinic tradition is the 120 years doesn't represent a human lifespan, is that the giants were given 120 years of a time to repent. And so one of the interesting things, this is kind of getting at your question, where the, the giants aren't just sort of understood as these bad guys, as these horrible figures. They're understood as there's some sort of motif of repentance or the possibility of repentance that they were given. And then in the rabbinic tradition, they, they didn't, you know, like, like the flood happened because they didn't use that 120 years correctly. But in some of these texts, it's not actually clear that the giants die in the flood. That's another part of it. But there's some motif of like, why give these transgressive figures revelation? It has to do with this idea of, I'd say, the possibility of repentance. One part of the book of giants, it says for them, it's salo in the Aramaic, but it says to pray. Like tells them to pray after they get this knowledge. Why tell them to pray? My sense is like, okay, you know this is happening. You know they have this judgment against you. Like, try to repent or try to ch- do something about it. So we'll talk about the Manichaean Book of Giants more in a minute. But there we actually have explicitly some of these giant figures repenting for having committed murder in the past. So there's very much in the tradition that's not just these giants are these bad, horrible creatures, but there's some idea of like wicked creatures, at least some of whom tried to go a different path when they saw that God was angry at them. So like one of the interesting things about the Dead Sea Scrolls is they weren't just telling stories about giants as these like horrible, wicked creatures. It was a little more nuanced than that that we can see now. But just with these fragments, because these texts are so poorly preserved. This is like hints of a sort of another antediluvian narrative about giants, you know? I was talking to Justin Sledge from Esoterica. He studies the history of esoteric traditions. We talked about the Watchers and and the Book of Giants a little bit. And Justin Mm, liked to point out that in modern conveyance of the Watchers and the Giants, people tend to portray them as like these kind of edgelord, dark, evil, satanic figures. But like, Justin points out, like, they're more like Beavis and Butthead. They're like impetulant teenagers. They go around, they eat everybody's food, they cause a lot of problems, make a lot of noise, things like that. They want to understand. I don't know if this fits with your Beavis and Butthead analogy, but, like, they want to understand. And, like, there's this understanding of dreams what dreams meant in the ancient world. Dreams were a a message from the supernatural world and that you needed a person with specific training or knowledge to unlock that message. And so getting a dream without a proper interpreter, it's like getting an email uh, from a really important person that like won't open, you you know, it's kind of frustrating. Like why is, you you know, like like the example I use for my students is that like, what if the president of the United States sent you an email and you, you couldn't open it, you, you know, why is he contacting me, you know, and then you can't open it. And, and so there's something like that going on, like that they, they want to understand. That's kind of one of the key things driving the narrative. You've been given this whole, this a key message and you want to understand. And it's, it, it's much more, I, I don't know how that fits into the Beavis and Butthead thing, but they're not just kind of these evil transgressive guys, evil in the Hollywood sense. There's more going on than that. Let's just kind of get into the dreams and the dream interpretation, because I always love talking about that. I'm a big fan of Artemidorus. The importance of dreams, like you mentioned, is not just important to the Jewish literature, but it's important to antiquity in general. It's important to the Persian, the Assyrian, all of these cultural milieu. Like we understand dreams as significant. And like if I have a dream or you have a dream, you'd ask a friend, well, I had had a weird dream. What this is what what do you think it means? And you could talk about it. But I'd say one macro point in antiquity was a sense that dream interpretation was a learned skill, a domain of expertise where it's not just asking your friend like, oh, what do you think? But rather the sense that like it's a technical art, the idea that there would be something that you'd be trained in a body of literature. Like we have this in the Mesopotamian context, a whole domain of omen manuals that a dream interpreter would have to be familiar with. And uh, you see this in the book of Genesis, for example, like when Joseph is in that prison, the the cupbearer and the baker are depressed because they have been given dreams, but they don't have anyone to interpret them. You know, it's like there's this key message, but they're in prison and there's no dream interpreter there until Joseph shows up. So it's, it's very much a domain of expertise in a way that we don't really kind of see in our own culture. You're right. It's cross-cultural. It was a thing in the, with the Greeks and the ancient Jews and the, the Mesopotamians, the sense that like that you needed kind of a sage 
to make sense of a dream. And that's what you get in the book of giants. Like the, the sense that Enoch is the guy and the sense that it was like that he's far away, meaning it shows you the value of that. You need to sort of, to get this information, like you need to kind of like the sage is at the end of this long journey and you need to kind of travel. This shows that the, the, the commitment that you have to kind of getting this information that you travel to a sage at the end of the world. And like that guy knows everything is kind of the idea. As you said, Enoch is the man, especially in this book. So let's talk about Enoch and most okay. importantly, the relation of the book of giants to the Enochic corpus. I'll first back up that and say, because people might have a sense of this, they might not. But the way I often start out with students is pointing out that if you look in our New Testament, in the letter of Jude, they cite a figure by the name of Enoch and they quote a passage from him. So even if someone doesn't know anything about Enochic literature, I want to start by emphasizing that the culture that produced the New Testament very much understood that there was a figure of Enoch and that there were texts understood that had a scriptural value associated with it. So one of the first questions is sort of like those first Christians had some sort of conception of Enochic literature, and that's been lost by us. With one major exception, if you look in the Old Testament of the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, they have in their Old Testament a book called the Book of Enoch. We Scholars call it First Enoch. And there I should mention, as a side note, if you look at the Rastafarian tradition, because the Rastafarians very much identify Ethiopia as the black Israel, so they copy the Ethiopian Bible. So one group in the States where you actually do have Enoch in their scripture is the Rastafarians. So it was scripture in antiquity. We have early Christians saying like that verse that a lot of evangelicals use, 2 Timothy 3, that like, like that the scripture is inspired. We have early Christians talking about these Enochic texts, citing that verse from Timothy to talk about it as inspired. And the literature we're talking about is a large amount of material, about 108 chapters, five separate books that all in different ways valorize the figure of Enoch as a recipient of divine revelation and that he was taken by angels, shown mysteries about the world. The sense that he's very much an exceptional figure of knowledge. Like it says in chapter 19 that I've seen things that no other human has seen. Like the angels kind of showed him around, they tour around the, the world. And he's also taken up into heaven and shown heavenly secrets there. And he, he's told to go back down and write these things down. So very much the idea that he is sort of this an exceptional figure with privileged access to the divine world and heavenly knowledge. And in some of the traditions, like this really gets extensive. There's a Hebrew text called Third Enoch, where he's actually transformed to a point where he's higher than the angels, and he can go into levels of heaven that the angels can't go. And he's actually called there, it's an amazing phrase, little Yahweh, meaning like he's kind of above the angels and where they stress this Enoch figure to such an extent traditions we normally call monotheistic seem a little less so. But the earliest stuff from the third century BCE, written in Aramaic, are two texts, the Book of the Watchers and the Astronomical Book. The Book of the Watchers described drawing on these Genesis 6 traditions that there was this transgressive sexual interaction between angels and earthly women before the flood, and it resulted in these children the children actually talked about in brief but positive ways in Genesis 6, like men of renown. And the term translated as giants means more like powerful men, soldiers. But they're very clearly these horrible transgressive figures in the Book of the Watchers. Like they're 3,000 cubits tall, so like over a mile. First they eat the food of the people. Then they eat the people. And then they start eating them each other. It's kind of more like language of chaos than evil. Like they're not trying to take power. It's not like two sides good and evil. They're eating each other. It's this transgressive, unadulterated eating. And in the Watchers tradition, that's why the flood happens. Humans are the victims of these antediluvian crimes, not the agents. Like in the Genesis flood story, it happens to punish human evil. So it's a little different in this tradition. And then these Watchers feel remorseful and they go to Enoch. And so angels on earth, send this human being to heaven to like repent. So there's a whole narrative going on there. And that the astronomical book I'll say less about because it gets into some technical details about astronomy, but it very much understands this idea that Enoch was given knowledge about the heavenly world 
and rather kind of technical ways. So that's what we have in First Enoch. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 50s, they knew that some of this stuff was Enochic, but they initially thought that there were some texts in the Aramaic that they had just found that didn't fit with the Book of the Watchers at all. So they assumed, you go back to like what Millick, one of the first scholars on this was saying in the 50s, was that like there was material omitted as the, the text got translated from Aramaic into Greek and then into Ethiopic. Some of that stuff got removed. And now we identify that stuff as a separate narrative called the Book of the Giants and sort of a separate antediluvian narrative that in some ways is very directly connected to the book of the watchers and watchers is just an aramaic term for angels but we call it the book of the watchers the like some of the same angels so one of the things that makes the book of watchers interesting it shows more interest in the heavenly world it's the oldest jewish text with named angels and some of those named angels come up in the book of the giants like shemichaza or barakael but the Book of Watchers doesn't give names to their sons. But the Book of Giants, that's why they call it the Book of Giants. It focuses more on, it gives names to their children. So like at one level, they're taking the Book of Watchers narrative and kind of fleshing out some of the details. And Enoch obviously figures in both. But in other ways, it's a different narrative. The whole idea of these giants getting dreams and trying to figure, that is nowhere in the Book of the Watchers, nowhere. And there's no sense that they're like, 3,000 cubits tall, which is like a mile. There's no sense of that in the Book of Giants. So at some level, they're taking these traditions, but it's, they're not just kind of midrashically expanding them. It's also a whole separate tale. And that's one of the, the things that is so interesting about this that I would stress is a sense that all of this stuff shows that in the third and second century BCE, these scribes had a lot of interest in the antediluvian period in the distant past. And one point I'd mentioned, we often forget this about the Bible, because like you look at the New Testament, they're really interested in figures like Adam and Eve and some of these from these first chapters of Genesis, that interest in the deep, deep past is already established. But you go to the Hebrew Bible and you go after those first chapters of Genesis, there's almost no interest. Like where in the Hebrew Bible do they talk about the Noah's flood? Do they talk about Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel? A couple places, but there is not this interest in the deep primordial past. And so it's a larger issue. But the idea is that that interest in the deep past is something that happens in the Hellenistic period, like in the third century BC, that's kind of presumed by the time we get to the New Testament. So this material actually shows a really, really forgotten moment. In the history of Judaism that you you can't see if you're only looking at the Bible, where an interest in the in the deep primordial past really becomes a thing, you know, like generally in the Hebrew Bible, when they're interested in the past, they start talking about Abraham and the sequence of patriarchs or, or Moses or something. It's an interest in the past, but it doesn't go as far back. So this holy Naki tradition is this forgotten thing that gives us an important window into the tradition we presume. It reminds me also of the preponderance and fascination that the Sethian Gnostics had with the primordial period, figures yeah. as well. Like yeah. you see yeah. that in Dylan Burns's work, Apocalypse of the Alien God, and the emphasis in the Sethian corpus on these figures like Zostrianos and yeah. Arsanes, things like that. At that point, they take that sort of primordial interest and ramp it up even more that there was all this kind of prehistory to Genesis 1 stuff that you need to kind of understand Genesis 1 and the light of, you know? So uh, yeah, I'd say all that stuff, it starts in the third century BCE, and then the stuff you're getting, like second century or third century CE, man, it's a whole thing. Yeah, that stuff, the elaboration, the traditions are much more richer and extensive. It really raises another question. Dylan points out that the whole point of emphasizing these pre-Platonic figures is mm -hmm. to create a kind of sense of authority beyond somebody like Plato, right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, since this is a scribal culture, the period we're talking about with the Book of Giants, <coughs> Book of the Watchers, if they're doing something similar in terms of trying to lay claim to a certain authority in terms yeah. of invoking these type of figures. So definitely with the figure of Enoch, that there's very much a sense that there was this kind of cachet of prestige associated with this figure. 
when this stuff was being produced that they want to kind of attach to this narrative. You see Enoch cropping up in ways that in this period, in some of the traditions that would be a bit surprising to us because we've forgotten him. One retelling of Genesis traditions from the Dead Sea Scrolls, they want to show that Abraham was this wise man. So they depict Abraham reading a book of Enoch. And, and it's interesting, like we have the Enochic literature, it's it presented as books attributed to Enoch. And the tablet that in the Book of Giants that Mahaway brings from Enoch, it, you can see in the text in the Aramaic fragment of this, that it really emphasizes that what you're reading is a copy of something written from the hand of Enoch. So very much emphasizing Enoch as this author that this kind of scribal medium is preserving these words of this great man, this great figure of wisdom. And the textuality is this link between these figures of great wisdom in the past. And in that sense, one thing I'd stress with all of that is the stuff is in Aramaic. Most of the scrolls are in Hebrew. So one of the questions is why is this stuff is in Aramaic? And one of the reasons is this understanding that Aramaic was the language of the ancestors of early Israel. So meaning like it's kind of the fitting language to talk about the distant past. And so like in the Torah, it says Deuteronomy 26, that my father was a wandering Aramean, well, Aramaic speaker. Or like the story with Jacob and when Laban, like in Genesis, when Jacob goes to northern Mesopotamia, the story with his daughters, with Leah, like in Genesis 31, they don't make a big deal of it. But all that is going on in the narrative is they're speaking Aramaic. There's understanding that that older strand of the family, they're Aramaic speakers. So the sense that like Aramaic represents an earlier chapter in the history of Israel, maybe analogy might be like in the Book of Mormon, when they're presenting these claims of revelation made in the 19th century, but they're using this kind of King Jamesian English, this kind of this intentionally antiquated form of English to sort of convey as the medium for this revelation. There's something like that going on. Like if I want to say that God or Jesus told me something, I'd start using these and thous. And you know what I mean? The antiquated nature of the language is a way to kind of showing its value. And there's something going on just by analogy in Homer as well, right? The dialect in Homer is kind of yeah. artificial blending of yeah. all these different dialects, right? To yeah. convey yeah. kind of otherworldly sense, to convey like a heroic kind of space. So yeah, yeah, it would definitely make sense. This is another point of analogy. You mentioned like they don't make a big deal about topography, but I would argue that topography, especially in texts like these, is never innocent. There's yeah, always a yeah. point to, you know, saying this is from this place. Yeah. I think back to like yeah. the Iliad. Why is Achilleus and everybody who's a name in this text from Thessaly versus somewhere else? Like yeah. they, yeah. lay claims to some kind of topographical importance. The geography, a book of giants and the Enochic literature is really interesting. Yeah, and it's not neutral information. And one of the ideas there is they're sort of articulating an understanding of the world in terms of. Jewish tradition and the Jewish past. There's a scholar at, at Harvard, Paul Cosman, who I heard him do a great paper on this, meaning like in the third century BCE, in the context of this early Hellenistic world, you don't just have Alexander going to India, but you have different accounts of these a kind of world explorers of people sort of making claims about traveling the world. And so when it says that it's Enoch, like, you know, I went places no other person. It's kind of like this Jewish way of kind of putting this mantle down. It's these figures of the Jewish past who sort of delineated the world and talked about what's in the West and what's in the East, not some of these other folks. It's almost saying to kind of Christopher Columbus, like, oh, it's one of our guys. Mm -hmm. He's one, the guy who figured all that stuff out. He's one of our guys. Like, that's a kind of analogy, I guess. But you know, you're exactly right. Enoch gets to describe the world to us. Geography, like what's on the East and what's on the West. The geography of this material is really interesting. These giants have very interesting names. You could kind of just talk about the story's relation to Mesopotamian myth. I, I'd say there's a number of names we have for these giants. The two brothers are called Oya and Hayyan, and the theophoric element of those names comes from the Tetragrammaton from God, and so does the name Mahawe, which is interesting because a lot of the angel names, they have that E-L at the end, like Michael, Raphael. And so a lot of times with the angels, you have these L theophorics, but with the sons of the giants, you often have these Yahwistic theophorics, which is kind of interesting. And that's not a Mesopotamian thing, but one of the things you're getting at 
is, well, probably two, it's very fragmentary, but it's explicit that one of the giants is called Gilgamesh, which is very interesting because Gilgamesh is the name of the epic hero in the Mesopotamian epic, which was revered at the time, uh, meaning if you were in Mesopotamia in the Hellenistic period, it was like the Homer of that culture. If you learned how to write, you would learn using the epic of Gilgamesh. It wasn't just some obscure thing that like nerds knew. Everyone knew about it. It had this cultural cachet, like Shakespeare or something. We even have Gilgamesh fragments from Palestine, from Canaanite leaders. So so the, the Gilgamesh thing is really widespread. And I'd emphasize two things. So one, Aramaic was an important language in Mesopotamia. We don't have any Aramaic versions in antiquity of the Gilgamesh epic, but thinking of Aramaic as a medium for Mesopotamian cultural knowledge, Aramaic is a medium in which Mesopotamian myth could travel into non-Mesopotamian contexts. So it's, it gets in another way of the value of Aramaic, but it also shows how they're imagining the distant past. They're assimilating because the Gilgamesh epic understands that this great epic hero from the distant past, similar to like how the Homeric stuff talks about Achilles or something. And Gilgamesh was a warrior in the same way, like with Achilles, kind of one divine parent and one human parent. And they explained his military prowess as having kind of the semi-divine potency, which is exactly what you have with these giants, the Gibberim, the mighty men, like it talks about them as these kind of martial, powerful figures from the distant past. They're attacking people. They're killing people. So there's kind of an assimilation of the Mesopotamian conceptions of the distant past into sort of they're claiming Gilgamesh as like one of their own but also sort of making him this negative figure, like kind of the sense that, oh, the oldest stuff is Mesopotamian, but like we're kind of making it Jewish stuff. This kind of Jewish effort to sort of articulate the distant past as one of their own. One other thing, this is not so much a name thing, but it's really interesting that the two main giants are brothers, Oya and Haya. And this is a book of giants thing we don't see in the book of watchers at all, but a kind of doubling motif. You have these two brothers, and they're each given dreams. The dreams relate together. And we only have one in the exit narrative, but there's two journeys that this one giant makes to Enoch. And there's two tablets as well. And we don't have the full narrative, but they're read at separate times. So this whole doubling thing is going on there. And one way of understanding it, it says this in the Joseph material in Genesis, that how do you know a dream is actually a significant message from the divine world and not just something less significant? It's if you get the same dream twice. Like if you get the same dream twice, then you know someone in the heavenly world is trying to tell you something. So the doubling motif is kind of a legitimization device. And they're taking that whole doubling thing and maxing it out. It's two dreams. It's two brothers. It's two journeys. Like this this whole doubling thing that like comparison to the Book of Watchers really doesn't help us with it at all. So so I I wish more people would would read the Book of Giants, you know. And the other thing I'd say about it, like if you look at the references to the giants in Jewish literature we knew about before the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's hints of these things in texts like third maccabees or the wisdom of solomon which you in, in, in third maccabees where they're compared to the men of sodom who were destroyed like in that genesis story with lot and, and lot's wife so the presumption that we get from the, the material we knew is that these giants were like these horrible horrible creatures and what is the value of knowing them the value is that wicked people are punished The giants are a cautionary tale of people who were wicked in the distant past, whom God punished, and therefore don't be wicked. That's what you would infer from the extern tradition that we have. And that was very much a thing that the Wisdom of Solomon, 3rd Maccabees, other texts. But now we actually have some of these actual ancient texts themselves. And some of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually say that same point, like a text called the Damascus document. But our most extensive text about the giants does this whole other thing. Yes, there was transgression, murder and a transgressive eating, but there's a whole other thing going on where they're they're getting dreams and trying to understand them. Uh, this is a larger point about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't just fill in more information about ancient Judaism. They complicate it. One of the larger points here is that biblical studies as a field developed without hardly any actual text from ancient Israel. 
meaning like the Bibles that it's all based on were generally copies from the late antique or the medieval period that people were kind of studying to understand ancient Israel and comparing it with ancient texts like tablets from Mesopotamia or things from Egypt. But the actual evidence from ancient Israel was not much. And now we actually have the Dead Sea Scrolls, actual ancient texts. And in some ways, they fit with our knowledge of the distant past, but they also complicate it. And the Book of Giants really is a good example of that. They were telling these stories about the Antediluvian past that you know, we weren't prepared for it. No one would have predicted, like, oh, I think in ancient Israel, they told stories about these giants having dreams. Like, no one would have thought that. You know what I mean? There's a Russian proverb from the early communist period, like the past is getting harder to predict. There's something like that with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now they actually see how they were talking about the past. It's in ways that we weren't prepared for. That's kind of what I love about texts like the two-volume Old Testament pseudepigrapha really gives this amazing view of the diversity of yeah. the cultic and ideological practices at the time. Like you were talking about the book of giants and how that subverts our basic understanding of the giants until recently. I think back to something we've had for quite a while, like fourth Ezra, mm-hmm. fourth Ezra has the same kind of deal where like you have this scribal figure who's yeah. described in a certain way in the canonical text. But he's doing something completely different from what you would expect. So I encourage your listeners, if they're interested in ancient Israel and the biblical tradition, they should very much go. The Bible's great, but you also need to kind of go beyond it, particularly anyone interested in the apocalyptic tradition, because there's a whole bunch of apocalyptic texts from ancient Judaism and ancient Christianity that you completely miss. The book of Revelation is great. Book of Daniel is great. But like those are the only two biblical apocalypses, and there's a whole other world of apocalypses out there. One of the things that is really interesting about the Book of Watchers, I said earlier, it was the earliest example we have of named angels like Raphael or Gabriel in the Jewish tradition. It's also the earliest example we have of explanations of the origins of demons. So we could think about the Book of the Watchers itself as a kind of ancient Jewish demonology. And what I mean by the adding the ology to that is not just accounts of demons, but some sort of ancient intellectual project to systematize or make sense of demons. So the idea there is at the time, like Some people in our culture today, the sense that the world is pervaded with these spiritual figures that can be quite dangerous or malevolent, and you need to sort of be on the lookout for them. That's presumed in the Book of the Watchers, but it tells you where they came from. Meaning, like I said earlier, that these giants are punished in the flood. But if you look at chapter 15, you have an account of the punishment of both their angelic fathers and the sons. In chapter 10 of First Enoch, the angels are put in the netherworld, sort of like a holding area and to await the final judgment. But the giants, it says their physical bodies are destroyed, but their spirits remain. And it talks about the spirits as they're commanded to like attack people, harass people. And particularly it goes after pregnant women, which is very interesting because if you look at ancient demon accounts, that's often a very common thing that it was women, particularly pregnant women, that were really worried about demons because the idea is if you think about pregnancy, which can be a difficult issue in our own culture, but if you think about it in this kind of pre-modern medical context, it was much more dangerous, both for the woman and the child. And this was kind of rational. Like what You see this across the board. I team taught a course on demons with a professor of Tibetan Buddhism and the material he looked at, it was the same sort of thing. But this idea that the nastiest demons don't like pregnant women is trying to rationalize the difficulty of childbirth. One example of this, anyone who's watched The Exorcist knows that kind of scary demon from Iraq, this Pazuzu, but in that scary image that makes that movie so frightening, it was actually used as an amulet by pregnant women. And there the idea was this image, but it's not just this good versus evil thing. This is understood as kind of this f- power that was trying to ward away this demonic figure that had control over other demons to like back off, don't touch her kind of idea. So you very much have this something like that going on in the Enoch tradition. The, the demons are really spirits of giants who died long ago. So the sense of all these demons that were sort of understood to populate the world and harass people, 
This text tells you where they came from. I should also say that Anak tradition says they died in a war against themselves. So sort of like turning that kind of martial warrior aspect against themselves. And this is very much part of kind of a lost aspect of Christian and Jewish demonology. For example, there's a Christian text called the Testament of Solomon that lays out all sorts of detailed things about the demonic world. Oh it actually took up the Gerasene demoniac story from Mark 5, but the legion demon there saying, I died in a war among the giants long ago. So they sort of connect that legion demon as one of those giants that the Enochic tradition is sort of talking about. So there's a real connection. And one of the ideas where you actually see this in evangelicals today is it's really common to understand that they'll use the term Nephilim as basically synonymous with the term demon. The term Nephilim very much comes out of the Enochic tradition. That term is used in Genesis 6 in a very ambiguous way, but often understood as another term for the offspring of the angels. So one of the things that I try to teach my students is we can't talk about the Enochic tradition being forgotten, but it's also kind of right in front of us. But we don't realize it's just kind of assimilated into the sort of things we are looking at. But like there's actually kind of this Enochic element in contemporary demonology, but the Enochic material has just been so forgotten that you're not kind of seeing that it's right in front of you, I guess I would say. But the whole equation of Nephilim as a term for demons, that's an Enochic thing. So that point that I just went over, that is not there in the Qumran Book of Giants. It doesn't talk about their fates, and it might have been there, but we don't really have a full narrative of that. It might have been there. It's kind of hard to go do a lot with that. But you brought up the Manichaean tradition, and this is a very important point we should stress. Your viewers might know that there was a religious tradition that flourished in the third and fourth centuries and beyond called Manichaeism. And sort of started by a Persian figure in the third century CE. And he very much understood himself as kind of a, it's almost like a, a sort of an early theory of world religion, where there's a scriptural tradition, very much kind of drawing from stuff from Judaism and Christianity, like understood himself as the last prophet, understood himself as sort of the scriptural tradition, a very aggressive missionary dimension, and very much understood it as kind of a world religion. Like one of the texts attributed to him says like, you know, Jesus is for the West and Buddha is for the East, but my religion is for the whole world. You know, very much the sense that it was actually quite important in the kinds of religion in that period in the Near East. And once the Christians got power, they really, really used that against the Manichaeans. Like the figure of Augustine was a Manichaean in his 20s. And then when he became a bishop, he like really aggressively persecuted those same figures. And a similar thing happened in Islam like in areas where when Islam became dominant, that they kind of persecuted the Manichaeans. So it's another case like the Enoch tradition, where it's kind of like this ancient religious diversity that was stomped out. I draw most of my knowledge about Manichaeism from the seminal work of Jason Badoon on this. Since Manny came from an Elkasite apocalyptic Jewish milieu. Yeah. And yeah. he really was familiar with these concepts and he yeah. really brought them all together. All the religions were small bodies of water that led into the vast ocean of his religion. Yeah, it fits exactly what you're talking about, that Mani was an Aramaic speaker. But the idea that these Enochic texts were talking, were circulating in Aramaic is a whole other kind of late antique phenomenon of that thing we were talking about earlier, was this Aramaic scribalism kind of engendered all of these new forms of religious expression. So for a long time, the only main source to kind of understand the Manichaeans, because the Manichaean texts were burned and destroyed, was sort of accounts by their detractors, accounts by more orthodox figures talking about like how horrible these Manichaeans are. And it'd be kind of like, imagine if the only thing we knew about Democrats today are things reported on like right-wing media. You, you know what I mean? That would be an analogy. Yeah, it'd be like if we lost everything in terms of objective accounting of the Democratic Party and all we had left were like the QAnon accounts. Exactly. But some of those accounts were actually quite lengthy and provide some sort of the, not just talking points, but also details about them. And some of those accounts 
talked about the canon of, of Manichaean scriptures, even though we didn't have those texts. But one of those names of the Manichaean scriptures, that, those titles that came up in those lists was something called the Book of Giants. But we didn't really know what it was. But around 1900, you have excavations by Germans in northwest China. Because you have the Manichaeans and actually Christians too spreading. We tend to think of like this missionizing kind of in a westward direction into Europe because it was Christianized. But a similar thing happened going eastward. And so they found in a place called Turfan, which is now in Xinjiang province, the sort of the northwestern province, the Muslim dominated province, which is now like a weird site of newer forms of technology involving surveillance. It's a very odd thing that's happening there now. The Chinese government is really, really mistrustful of the Muslim population there. But this this Turfan site, they found around 1900, a collection of Manichaean documents. So they're fragmentary, but from the Manichaeans themselves. It's kind of analogous to the Nag Hammadi stuff vis-a-vis the writings, vis-a-vis the Gnostics. Like, you kind of let them speak for themselves. These texts are very fragmentary in a range of Central Asian languages, Sogdian, Uyghur, which is Old Turkic, and Middle Persian, which was not a language local to Central Asia, but an Aramaic-based language from the Near East that went into Central Asia, kind of preserved there as a scribal language, kind of analogous to Latin being preserved in places where it wasn't actually spoken, like in England or France or something. And some of the scraps talk about giants. And some of those same fragments talk about Enoch. And they talk about two brothers named Oya and Haya. And they talk about one of the giants visiting Enoch. So this stuff was actually found before the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we actually have accounts of the Manichaean Book of Giants before the Dead Sea Scrolls. But even then, those scholars looking at it was like, hey, this stuff has a connection to Enochic literature, which fits with the, the Manichaeans were interested in all that kind of primordial antediluvian stuff. This Manichaean stuff was going on in the obscure world of ancient Iranian studies and Manichaean studies, like it was a kind of different domain of scholarly knowledge. But one of the great insights of Millick, who was very much a polymath, this is Yosef Millick, one of the first scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was the guy that I mentioned earlier in the 50s that argued, oh, like these Aramaic Enochic texts from Qumran, they talk about all sorts of stuff that's not in Enochic literature. So it must have been take in the Book of Watchers and removed. In 1970, he came across the Manichaean Book of Giants, and it was this kind of this light bulb. Aha! Oh, so there was these fragments that don't fit in with the Book of the Watchers. There was actually a separate ancient Jewish text, which he called the Book of Giants, on the basis of this Manichaean Book of Giants. It's not just kind of comparative religion. Oh, let's talk about the create the creation myth in the Rig Veda is, or the ancient Hinduism is similar to Genesis 1, where you can kind of compare similar things. It's, it's, it's about the transmission of Enochic material going into Central Asia. Let me give you one very specific example. Mahaway in the Book of Giants is the father of a watcher called Barakael, which means the thunder of God. And Mahaway is the one that flies and goes to Enoch. And there's one text of the Manichaean Book of Giants, which is in Uyghur. We don't have the giant's name, but he's flying. He's talking with Enoch, and they preserve the Middle Persian of name. It's, they call him the son of Wirogdad. And Wirogdad in Middle Persian means gift of thunder. It's not exactly like thunder of God, but it's some kind of assimilation of these ideas. Mila kind of understood those two books as kind of the recensions of the same text. I'd kind of say it's a Manichaean adaptation of an older Jewish book, but like they definitely have traditions in common. And in the Manichaean stuff, these giants are very much understood. They're using the term demon and Nephilim as kind of synonymous with these figures. There they get very much adopted into these elaborate schemes of Manichaean cosmogony and cosmology that is really different from anything that you get in the older Jewish stuff. So, for example, one of the rich features of the Manichaean accounts of the world was you had these kind of elaborate battles of forces of light and darkness, and you had the understanding that this world is there were kind of fragments and remnants of these older battles. So, like, there's traps of light hidden in 
different things in this world from that perspective. There's five sons of what they call the living spirit that are overseeing different parts of the cosmos. And one of those five sons is called the king of honor. And they talk about the watcher's myth, the sort of these watchers that go down from heaven. It's presented as a rebellion against the king of honor. They're more like demonic figures there. So the whole thing becomes kind of raw material for new Manichaean inventions of cosmogonic myth in a way that the older Jewish stuff couldn't predict it. But, but like, yeah, the demonic stuff gets really, really enriched there. So the Manichaeans kind of took the stuff and ran with it. It was really interesting. Dr. Goff, this has been incredible. I want to thank you for coming on, sharing your time. I love your enthusiasm. I love learning about this stuff. All right. Thanks. And I appreciate what you're doing.